Let's turn together in our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Peter's message that the Lord directed him to preach there on the day of Pentecost. And again, reading from the verse 22, which was the beginning of his message, and read down to verse 36. I want to speak with you about what this message concerns, and that is the hope of Christ's resurrection. Put a lot of emphasis because it is upon his death. Yet, were Christ not raised from the grave, where would be our hope? And here, Peter is directed to the Lord to speak not only of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but his burial and his resurrection. What that means to, first of all, the glory of God, the Father, the Christ glory, but what it means to needful. Sinners such as we are. Do we have a good hope? Or are we simply deluding ourselves, gathering here, like so many do in places of worship, and trying to make ourselves feel better about entering into eternity? Because that's where we're all headed. What is your hope? Is it based upon what the preacher says, or is God truly given you that good hope? which is in the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's not in Christ, then there is no hope. It's a false hope. Everybody has a hope. I think you figured that out by now. Everybody has a hope. There's some that even hope that when they die, off, that's it. They hope there is no judgment. They hope that there really isn't anything on the other side. And so they are like the Epicureans. Let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That's a hope. But is it a good hope? Not according to Scripture. There are some that have a hope in their zeal and their efforts and their works. And I will tell you, they are outworking any one of us sitting right here, right? Now. They are zealous. They're knocking on doors. They're traveling across land and sea to witness and to make as much of this life as they can in hope. That when they stand before God, they'll not be there empty handed. That's a hope. But the question is, is it a good hope? How would you rather go into eternity with a good hope or also? Because Christ himself said, there are many, many that stand before him someday and say, Lord, Lord, have we not? They had assurance of their salvation. Have we not done many mighty works in your name? Even naming the name of Christ. And what will Christ say, depart from me, you work for the name. God never knew you. So they had a hope. It's a false hope. I don't say that to scare anybody, but to bring us to the word. What is a good hope? Well, I'll tell you, the good hope is what we read right here from the scriptures. The hope of Christ, not only his doing and dying, but his rising again and setting on high. So that's what Peter is declaring here in verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. In other words, shut up and listen. Jesus of Nazareth. That despised man among you, but a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. You saw these things. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. See, those didn't even want to hear that. They wanted this to be their work. We, we put him away. We killed him. In essence, saying, no, you can't even take the glory for that. God put him on that cross. You delivered up the lamb and didn't even know. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified him. They'd find some other way to kill him. They, they wouldn't want that to be the way God got the glory, but that's how God got the glory. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified the slain. When he says wicked hands, these are the workers of iniquity. These were religious people of the day. These were the ones that the common folk look up to, to be their leaders and their guides. And boy, they were meticulous in all that the law required. Even Paul said, until it pleased God to reveal Christ in him, he was in view of the law blameless. That's how he saw himself. That's pretty courageous there. But there are people you run into that way. 
They don't see any fault in them. They, they truly believe that by their works, they're good, moral, upright people, and that they're working this out to God's glory. You can't convince them otherwise. Here, Peter says, you by wicked hands have crucified the Son. But you know what? That's the only thing that we have, even with regard to Christ, to offer up wicked hands. Any one of us here. They were simply our representatives. Crucifying him, that was my sin that nailed him to the cross. So, to see that in all that God purposed, that this means his son, Lord Jesus Christ, should die. But that's not the end of the story. That's why from here forward now, verse 24, all the way to verse 36, there's one message that we find, and that is in verse 24, whom God hath raised up. Again, I ask you, what would be the gospel message apart from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? There are people around the world today following founders of their religion who are dead. All they're doing is continuing the teachings and followings of a dead man. Do you realize with regard to the gospel of God, it's not that we are following someone who came, lived, and died. And now we're carrying on his legacy, the world says. But here, verse 24, whom God hath raised up that we sing, I serve a living Savior. Know that he is living, no matter what men say. You ask me how I know he lives, I know the hymn writer put, he lives within my heart, but that's a little subjective, isn't it? I like to sing it, it's written in his word. That's how I know he lives. If we don't believe this, let's take this Bible right now and burn it. Because it's a lie. And that's what men would like to believe, that somehow it's a lie. Like the Pharisees, that's how they continue to justify themselves. Let's say the disciples stole his Bible. Ask National Geographic or Time Magazine or Newsweek and all these. Every once in a while, they keep coming back to this. They can't let it go. They're looking for some traces, DNA or bones or somewhere where they're going to all of a sudden discover that he really did not rise. But ah, there it is. We found his body. We found his skeleton. We found his bones that the disciples buried all the way back there, and they wanted us to believe this lie all along. That's what they prefer. Just like with evolution. Why is it that men don't believe in God having created this world, this universe? It's because if they accept that God has created this whole thing, then they're accountable. That's the one thing that man doesn't want, accountability. They don't want to be accountable to anybody but themselves. If there were no other scriptures than these right here in Peter's message, and you notice he doesn't waste a lot of time getting to his point. It's all about Christ. It's one that you took and crucified and slew, but God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Look how scripture puts it. Sometimes we even speak of Christ's death very academically. Was there pain? Absolutely. That's all those that do believe that Christ came, died, and rose again. They believe the facts. That's all they know how to demonstrate. It's not in our doing and dying. It's not in what we sacrifice. It's in his sacrifice. But it's not just the physical pain. When it says here, having loosed the pains of death, stop and consider Christ should not have died were he as he was a sinless creature, being, he would have lived forever. So you say, well, why did he die? It was an execution. It was a punishment. It was a chastisement of God. And it wasn't just the physical pain. I emphasize this. There are martyrs who have died with a fire burning up their bodies and their hands raised, you can read about and God gave them grace to sing a hymn unto God as they went. Any view of Christ somehow melting under the physical pain and thinking that somehow it was the pain that he had to endure, he was beaten beyond measure. These pictures that artists paint of Christ hanging on the cross, 
in some pristine body. He was unrecognizable in that body. Plucking out his beard and his back beaten beyond whatever any man was. And yet none of that took his life. But the scriptures, when you read it, talk about a pain far above the physical. And this is where, unless God has opened your eyes to see why he died, you still have not seen yourself or who you are. It's my sin that nailed him to that cross. Scriptures speak of the travail of his soul. Never a man labored like our Lord Jesus Christ labored under the weight of the sin of that people for whom he came and was made a curse. He was sinless. But he died the just for the unjust. How many times do we say that without even stopping to think about what that would have meant for him to bear that sin in that body on that tree? Not just an innocent man, but a sinless man. He had to be without sin, without blame, just like that Old Testament lamb represented, Passover lamb. But I love reading this because not only in his resurrection was he loose from the pains of that death. In other words, he's no longer the sin bearer. It's done. It's finished. But the glory is that everyone for whom he paid the debt also have been loose from the pains of his death. See, that's what this death is. It's the resurrection means proof of our justification. Paul said there in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he was delivered up for our offenses on behalf of or because of, and he was raised for or because of our justification. When he rose from the grave, there is no more suffering that he could ever endure. He's finished the work. He's paid the price. And that's why it says in verse 24, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Why was it necessary that he spend three days in that grave, three nights? Well, number one, to prove that he was dead. That's proof positive right there. There wasn't anybody in that day when they put that body in that tomb and took it off the cross and was saying, oh, he's in a coma. Or merely swooning. And now all of a sudden he came to and pushed that rock out. Because what's required for satisfaction for sin of God? Death. It's not just that he shed his blood, but shed it unto death. It's the shedding of blood unto death that was required. So how do we know that if he died for me, my sins were put away? Well, two things. One, I love the way it's put here. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. If there remained yet one sin for which Christ had not paid the debt, that he could not have come forth. But I'm thankful to be able to stand here today and declare not one sin. And if he died for my sin, I mean, not one of my sins could hold him in that. It's finished. I don't know about you, but that's good news. And as the Lord continues to teach me, I used to think the older you got, the easier it gets. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the older you get, the more the weight of being in this body. The weight of my sin, what I'm fearing about. You take a deep breath sometimes because you wonder, as much as the Lord has taught me, how is it that I continue to be the sinner that I am? Well, the Lord does that to get our eyes off ourselves and on Christ. But here's the good news is that not one of my sins could hold him in that grave. If you paid the debt, it paid, it's finished. And the proof is in the resurrection. People still hate Christ like they hate him, but they just can't get their hands on him. You see him in glory. He's risen. And the scriptures say he's coming again. It says without sin. It doesn't mean that he ever had. It means that he's not coming again as a sin bearer. He's coming to claim to himself everyone for whom he paid the debt. That's a glorious hope. That's why this message, the hope of Christ's resurrection. Now, 
You say, well, where's the scripture, Peter? He started with scripture in Joel chapter 2. All of this is scripture. And down here in verse 25, it says, for David speaketh concerning him. So what we're seeing here by Peter is that he's demonstrating that no matter where you turn in the scripture, turn the page wherever you will, you can blindly if you want to, just turn and point in the scripture. And I will tell you that every scripture is given by inspiration of God as prophet for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? Righteousness. Who's righteousness? Him who is that righteous one. That's Christ. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. We need the Lord to open our eyes to reveal it. But that's what Peter's doing. He's going back here to Psalm 16, where he says, David speaketh concerning him. There's those that argue, well, this was all about David and his experience, etc. Nope. What does your Bible say? For David speaketh concerning him. True of every one of the Psalms. Psalm 1 all the way. We just finished Psalm 150. We've been at it for since 2010. So it's going on eight, eight years. Just wrapped up Psalm 150 today. But guess what? We wrapped up just like we started. Blessed is the man. In Psalm 1, that's Christ. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 150, that's Christ. It's all Christ. Peter says, David speaketh concerning him. He said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So David was writing this concerning his hope. And where is it that he saw the Lord? Always before his face, seated on my right hand. That's the right hand of the majesty on high that I should not be moved. So if you went back there to Psalm 16 and verse 8 and read it, it's the same thing that Peter quotes here. You would say, okay, well, that was David's hope. I'm telling you, as we read on here, it was more than David's hope. This is actually a psalm that our Lord Jesus would have prayed unto his father as he faced the reality of his dying. On what was our Lord Jesus Christ cast as he faced this execution, this death at the hands of wicked men, of whom the scriptures say his mouth was like a lamb going to slaughter. Before his shears he was gone. He opened not his mouth. Some call that the passive obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Passive only in the sense that he was quiet. He commended his soul unto his father who judges righteously. He went to that grave in that hope that God the Father would be satisfied with that work that he accomplished and raise him again. And so, even as David spoke, our Lord would have seen the Lord always before his face, speaking of his Father, and see his place there at his right hand that he should not be moved or removed from that. Paul, writing to the Philippians, said that. It was for a time that our Lord thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but condescended to take on himself the form of a servant, become a man, and be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But whom God then highly exalted, how did he do that? Raised him up, that he might take again that place of glory, which was his all along. And so in verse 26, even as David contemplating Christ at the right hand of the Father, think of Christ contemplating what would be the end of all of this suffering. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Again, you can go back there and say, well, that was David. Resting in hope, knowing that when he died, the Lord Jesus Christ would come in time, that promised seed, and pay his sin debt, and take him into glory. When Christ arose from the grave, all those 
for whom he paid the debt in the Old Testament, rose with him. In other words, he took them into glory with him. You realize in the Old Testament, there's no mention of heaven. All those in the Old Testament that died went to a place called Sheol, a grave. So what were they waiting for? They were waiting for the Redeemer, like Job spoke of. In Job 19 and verse 25, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in that day shall stand on this earth. He wasn't talking about the second coming, like so many read that. He was talking about Christ's first coming. That in that redemption, this Redeemer would stand on this earth and be his sin bearer. And what was Job's hope of resurrection? That when Christ rose, he would rise with him. Just like any one of us. When Christ paid our debt and rose from the grave, we were in him. Just like the names of those that were in the high priest on his breastplate. We were in him. Such a degree that Paul writing in Ephesians says, we've been raised up together with him and we're seated in the heavenlies with him. I'm not there physically, but I'm there in my representative, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's my hope of glory. That's my hope in death. But here specifically, it's talking about the rejoicing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore did his heart rejoice even in the prospect of death, the writer of the Hebrews said, who for the joy that was set before him, I'll guarantee you there wasn't any laughing or joy in the suffering that he endured. But there was sure rejoicing of our Lord as he contemplated the end result of all of this. Being raised again and sent on high representing that people that the Father gave them from all eternity. That's why it says, moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Now the reason why I say here that it's not about David, but about Christ is based on what we're going to read here when Peter finishes quoting this scripture in Psalm 16. Right now he's just simply quoting in verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or in Sheol. That's that place of the dead. He didn't actually, like some things, go to hell. Some, because they twist the scriptures, they say, well, if he died on the cross, then he actually went to hell for three days. And he was down there preaching to dead souls. Nope. That's a figment of men's imagination. It comes out of man's depraved mind and not the scriptures. Here it just says, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in Gehenna, in Sheol, it was a place of the dead, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's such an important statement right there. That all of this our Lord coming this world, the sinless man, the righteous one, never did at any point any part of his substitutionary work cause him to be corrupted. That's so important because there are those even among so-called grace preachers. They're ones that you and I know and with whom we've had to have a separation, and rightly so, because they hold that unless Christ actually became in his substitution what we are, then he wasn't a true substitute. What they mean is that we are sinners, so he had to be made sin. I even heard one pridefully answer to me and say to me when I questioned him on this, well, God wouldn't put an innocent person to death, would he? He had to be just in putting his son to death, and that could only be because he was actually guilty in some way of the sin, not just put on him, but in him. I can't think of anything that makes me tremble more. Not only the thought of it, but because it's so contrary to Scripture. Notice the words of Scripture. If you would just pause. Even where it says he was made sin, what's the very next thing to say? 
who knew no sin. We get in trouble when we start to reason and think that somehow we got this figured out. He became what we are, even to the point of being a sinner. So now we become what he is. That means we've got a, some uh, perfect nature in us. That's how it's preached. But that's not what the scriptures say. Here it says, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He didn't suffer his holy one to see corruption even from the conception. Wouldn't you think that if it was a matter of Christ becoming a sinner to the degree that we're sinners, that it would have started all the way back there with him taking on the seed of Adam in the womb and then fighting his way out of it? That's not what God purposed. Even in the conception, in the womb, he wasn't made of the seed of the man. He was made of the seed of a woman. And it wasn't because the son of Mary was suddenly preserved as being sinless. And so out from her came the sinless one. That's not it. This is the miracle of God. This is why it's described as the mystery of godliness. God became a man. But I just know that in every aspect of his life and death, yes, he was tempted in every way such as we are, yet without sin, he had to be without corruption. That tells me right there it had to be a work of God. How could the Holy One live among wicked sinners even for 33 plus years of his life and never once? He tempted to sin. When it says he was tempted in all things, it doesn't mean that he was struggling inside, here should I, should I. It just means that the very things that we endure as sinners, he bore up under in that trial without sin, identified in every way without sin. And that's, again, part of the hope of, in fact, it's all my hope that when he died, God the sinless one. When he rose again, and he rose the sinless one. And because of his sinlessness, on my behalf, as my high priest, my substitute, I stand before him without corruption. Not in my being, but in my representative, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, he doesn't just say, neither wilt thou suffer him to see corruption. But what? The Holy One. There are no degrees of holiness. You're either holy or not. But the fact that in all of his suffering, he never saw corruption is where our hope of salvation from the life lies. It's in him. And that's why Peter's still quoting Psalm 16 all the way down through. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Yeah, we're going to see this wasn't about David. This was about Christ, for whom he wrote. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. I puzzled a little bit at that of why it's put in the plural, because you think, well, shouldn't you just read the way of life? Well, it took the ways of life in this, that it required perfect obedience on his part, obeying the law. Without that perfect obedience, his death would be well deserved. He would have died a sinner. It's about the redeemer. It's about the saving. It's about the justifier of whom they wrote. 